Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beatty 9. My wedding was a small outdoor affair held in my front yard and catered only by the bag of cheese puffs Nicholas Scobie passed around in celebration of his best friend's betrothal. Psycho Loco was spinning in circles singing, Matchmaker, Matchmaker, Make Me a Match, like a Mexican understudy for Tevi in Fiddler on the Roof. He had fulfilled his promise and repaid his debt by finding me a mail-order bride through the services of Hot Mama Sands of the Orient. I sulked in the driveway, refusing to look at my bride, my back to the stalled nuptials. Psycho Loco approached me with fake trepidation, rattling the bag of cheese puffs at me and asking why I was so upset. Oh nothing, just that you've arranged for me to marry a woman I don't even know without my permission. What, I fucked up the plans for the rest of your life? Gooner, you don't even have an alarm clock, so don't give me no bullshit that I've altered your destiny. Twisting my arm behind my back, Psycho Loco marched me toward the wedding party. Besides, you should feel honored. Yoshiko chose you over hundreds of potential husbands. I'm sure that was difficult. I wouldn't want to spend the rest of my life in Olympia, Washington, cleaning rifles, gutting deer, and drinking Coors Light down at the American Legion post either. Can you remove the gun from my kidneys? I'll go through with it. The UPS driver conducted the ceremony. Dressed in tree bark brown from head to toe like a misplaced Yosemite National Park ranger, he looked at my license, then back at me. Today's your 18th birthday, huh, kid? He tipped his brown baseball cap at the bride. Nice present. Yoshiko Katsu stood next to a stack of designer luggage, only slightly rumpled from the Trans-Pacific trip and the ride from the repository. Tall and thickly built, she stood stiffly, her arms straight down at her sides, smiling at everything that moved but never really taking her eyes off me. My mother and my baby-laden sisters sidled up to her, skeptical and unimpressed. Christina's baby pulled on the invoice stapled to Yoshiko's blouse. Nicole pinched a silky sleeve. Dior? Yoshiko nodded and bowed for no apparent reason. Sign here. The delivery man shoved a clipboard in my face. What happens if I don't sign? Then she goes back to the warehouse and collects dust for three days till we send her back to Japan fourth class, which probably will mean three weeks in the hot cargo bay of a transport ship. I penned my name and shoved the yellow copy in my back pocket. Ain't she got to sign nothing? Nope, she's just like a package. She came with instructions but it's all in Japanese. Oh I forgot, you may kiss the bride. And you can get your maple syrup looking ass in that truck now and go, before I kiss you with a foot so far up your ass you'll be spitting toenails for a week. Christina saucily sucked her teeth and hissed in Yoshiko's direction, girl, I know that's my brother, but you got to watch these niggers. After they get married, they change. Mmm, -hmm, like streetlights and diapers. You seen what happened to daddy, Nicole echoed, slapping Christina's palm. That's why I kicked my baby's father to the curb. What I look like, Sigmund Freud. Carl Jung. Eric Erickson. Yoshiko bowed in appreciation of their sisterly sagacity. So diso ka. Domo arigato gozaimasu. Psycho loco tossed me two tarnished gold bands. Ignore these spinsters. Step up, cuz, and be a man. I ripped off the price tag and boldly approached Yoshiko. There were no jitters. My hands didn't shake. My underarms were TV commercial dry. Sometimes the inevitable just seems right. Kanban wa. I fi, ni, san, fi, I said, exhausting my karate school Japanese and handing her a ring. She laughed, shook her head, and corrected my greeting, Kanan Ifai wa, pointing at the hazy midday sun. We slipped the rings on our fingers and kissed each other lightly on the cheek. 
She smelled like cardboard. As I stepped off, I noticed that some UPS jokester had stamped, fragile, on her forehead. Who dat heifer gooner with? I could hear the china shop's bulls coming around the corner. Nah, bitch, that's our nigger. Don't even feel it. You think you can come here playing Yokohama Hoochie Mama and steal our man, you got another thought coming. Yoshiko turned to face her tormentors, Betty and Veronica, crashing the wedding in a vain Dustin Hoffman showdown for my affections. Betty's hair was styled into a gold-flaked gramophone horn with a little hairpin crank just over the right ear. Veronica had so many extensions in her hair that the wavy locks cascaded down her body like a horsehair waterfall. Yoshiko looked confused, I think she was looking for Lady Godiva's white horse. I stepped in to help, but Scobie held me back. Hold up a sec. She's going to have to learn to cope. Let's see what happens. Betty and Veronica squared off and prepared to battle, thumbing their noses and bobbing up and down like amateur boxers looking for an opening. Veronica snapped a jab that stopped an inch from Yoshiko's nose. Yoshiko didn't flinch, she just bowed and said something in a terse Japanese. Veronica froze. What'd she say, Gunnar? She said that if you persist with your puerile inner city antics, she gonna take out her samurai sword, invoke her ancestral clan of warriors, and chop you into a negro roll, inside out with salmon roe. You don't speak Japanese. How you know that's what she said? Why you ask then, shit? Maybe she said, if I act like I know some karate, I can scare these stupid niggers senseless. They sure don't act like they do on television. Or maybe she was admiring your hair. Think so? Can she show us some of those crazy Japanese hairstyles? We could be the first ones on the block to wear top knots and shit. Maybe I'll dye my teeth black. I seen that on the late night kabuki plays. That shit would be fresh, nobody got a black teeth thing happening. Betty and Veronica lowered their fists and returned Yoshiko's bow and then clamored over her wedding ring. Mom, beaming like a lottery winner, wrapped a proud arm around Yoshiko and demanded that Scobie take a photograph of her and her new daughter-in-law. Gunnar, I like Yoshiko. I believe she'll make an excellent Kaufman. She got spirit, escaping from a repressive society to seek her fortune in a strange world. Ma, Japan ain't some feudalistic country. I mean, they got travel agents. Don't matter, I approve. I can't believe it. Thought you'd never approve of me marrying a woman who isn't black. Yes, but Yoshiko is black at heart. You can tell. She got soul-like, who's that actor I like always play the Japanese nigger in them shogun movies? Toshiro Mifune. Hearing a familiar name, Yoshiko nudged my mother in the ribs, put a bewildered look on her face, and started scratching the back of her head and her underarms, impersonating the famous actor. That's exactly who I'm talking about. Yoshiko, did you know Mifune was born in China? True, true. His first big part was the bandit in Rashomon. Then, Mom ushered Yoshiko into the house, lecturing her on Mifune's oeuvre and smoothly segueing from his role as a doctor suffering from syphilis in the quiet duel to the types of birth control available in the United States. Scobie, the do-nothing best man, admonished me for not carrying my bride over the threshold. I kicked him in the shin and told him the only thing I was carrying was a grudge against him for not buying any wedding presents. What, no blender, some bath towels, nothing. Cheap bastard. Come on, help me with these bags. We held the reception in the backyard. Psycho Loco played chef and showed impressive culinary skills, barbecued spare ribs, deviled eggs, and to make Yoshiko feel at home, he even threw together a jamming udon noodle soup. So, man, how you like your wife? Nicholas asked from across the table, sucking on a bone and sizing up Yoshiko, who was sitting next to me. She all right, I guess. She bow too goddamn much. That shit throws you off, don't it? 
I got leery and put my hand on my wallet, then I started bowing with my eyes closed, and when I opened them she was long gone, grubbing on corn on the cob. And your wife is looking fine picking that shit out her teeth, if I do say so myself. How did I like Yoshiko? I watched her loudly slurp her udon soup with such powerful suction a noodle bounced off her forehead, slithered down the bridge of her nose, and slunk into her mouth with a loud pop. I could see why my mom liked her, they had the same table manners, none. I remembered how when I showed Yoshiko our room she had carefully unpacked her books, put the titles in my face until I nodded and said, hmm, as if I could read the bold stroke Japanese. Psycho Loco once told me that in prison when two men fall in love, they have to be careful not to relax and give in to the passion, because just when you let yourself go, your lover slips his finger into your anus and you're punked for life. I squeezed my sphincter shut as Yoshiko lowered the empty plate from her face, wiped her mouth, and let out a healthy belch. It wasn't difficult to tell that Yoshiko was equally enamored with me. No one had looked at me the way she did since Eileen Litmus back in the third grade, and I knew what that look meant. Gunnar, I don't think that Yoshiko trusts you. She's staring at you like you General MacArthur. As we sat around the table eating dessert and drinking beers, everyone took the opportunity to raise glasses and congratulate the newlyweds. Soon the guests demanded that the couple belatedly exchange their vows. I stood and raised my beer can in Yoshiko's direction, placed my hand over my heart, and said, till death do us part. That's it, nigger. I can't make no promises other than that. What about, in sickness and in health, for richer or poorer? Look, all I know is we're going to die. And when we do, we'll be apart. What about if you two die at the same time? That's a good point. Okay, I amend my vow. Till death kills us. Now Yoshiko's turn. Mom, she doesn't even speak English. English? Yoshiko stood up sharply a little red-faced and wobbly from all the beer she'd drunk. Me speak English. To wild applause, Yoshiko pecked me on the lips, then climbed onto the tabletop, chugging her beer until she reached the summit. My bride, literally on a pedestal, was going to pledge her life to me. You couldn't wipe the smile off my face with a blowtorch. Yoshiko cleared her throat and threw her hands in the air. BRMMPHH bump BA boom bip. I'm the king of rock, there is none higher. Sucker MCs must call me sire. Ho. Anyone know how to say, I love you in Japanese? Mom paid for the honeymoon. She lent me the car, and Yoshiko and I drove to Six Pennants Mystic Mount, an amusement park in the Antelope Valley. We listened to the radio and communicated with nods and exaggerated facial expressions, pretending to understand our improvised sign language. As we coasted into the Mystic Mount parking lot, the wooden white lattice of Leviathan Loops, the world's largest roller coaster, loomed in the distance. Yoshiko screamed and hugged me, moving her hand over imaginary hill and dale. We skipped through the entrance, and for the first time in my life I waited in the endless line snuggling with a lover. I wasn't the odd one out, a car to myself, constantly having to crane my neck backward at my friends and their dates to see how much fun I was having. On the flume ride I sat between Yoshiko's legs in a fiberglass canoe while we sloshed through the dark tunnels, her chin resting on the nape of my neck, her fingertips cupping my chest. Before that first drop after the S turn through the eucalyptus branches, I didn't even know I had nipples. Now I was hyperventilating, struggling for air, dangerously rocking the canoe, and splashing the German tourists in front of us as Yoshiko continued to tweak my nipples. Got him himmel. Will the passenger in boat 37 please remain seated? After a day filled with centrifugal spins and freefalls, it was hard to tell whether I was dizzy with love or with motion sickness. We drove home in a weary silence punctuated only by Yoshiko calling out the names of familiar places. San Crayon Rampito Cribrillo, Rio Califas, Zuma Beach. 
the Pacific Coast Highway's sharp curves dropped off into foggy banks of nothingness. I felt like Columbus teetering on the edge of the world. Malibu. Malibu. Yoshiko, doing her Amerigo Vespucci land ho, tugging at my shirt sleeve, and pointing toward a small promontory overlooking the ocean. It had been a long time since I'd been to the beach at night. On Santa Monica nights when I was having trouble sleeping, would sneak out and play D-Day on the empty beaches, advancing toward the Normandy beachhead with a battalion of waves. Stay down, man, stay down. Sometimes I would play dead and let the tide spit up my limp body onto the shore. Tell mother I love, uh. While I went to get the blankets and the radio from the trunk, Yoshiko sprinted down the bluff, tossing her clothes to the sand and motioning for me to join her. Hand in hand, we walked into the onrushing Pacific in our underwear. The waves breaking around our shins, then slamming against our chests. Like drunken seal pups, we splashed about in the surf, riding the dark waves into the cold sand, young lovers run aground. Using the stuffed elephants we had one pitching dimes at pillows, we pressed our backs against the windshorn bluffs and gave each other language lessons beside a fire of driftwood and the remains of a synthetic log. I tried to teach her useful American phrases such as, consummate the marriage, nookie, and, let's get busy. Yoshiko's instruction was more practical. We played a game of phonetic charades in which she would say a Japanese word and I'd have to guess its English homophone. B are you? That's easy, beer. Okay, eserori. Celery. Come on, I thought Japanese was supposed to be hard. Ibiurihamu Rienkan. For score and twenty years ago, our forefathers, Abraham Lincoln. Rosan Zeryusu. What? Yoshiko threw a pile of sand in the air, stamped her feet, and waved her hands across the sky. Rosan Zeryusu. I have no idea what you're talking about. Frustrated, my sensei jumped me from behind and rubbed my nose into the sand. Rosan Zeryusu. Oh, I get it, Los Angeles. Rosan Zeryusu. With the stars as chaperones and Al Green as the R&B mariachi, we courted each other with our life stories and dreams. I couldn't understand her, but I listened intently and let the suntory whiskey Yoshiko pulled from her purse interpret. After one swig, I surmised that Yoshiko was a poor farmer running away from a lifetime of toil shucking wheat and paying homage to countless Shinto and Buddhist agrarian gods. Her hands, callous free on my cheeks, dismissed that theory. After two swigs she was a famous pop star with writer's block, hoping to regain her soulful edge by soaking up the African-American aesthetic. Singing alongside Al Green, Yoshiko sounded like a lisping crow with laryngitis. Here I am, baby, foam and take me. Here I am, baby, foam and take me. After half the bottle I was writing haiku on her bare back with my index finger, wife's rib cage expanding. Contracting, fanning virgin fires. Carnal bellows, mmm. Somewhere near the backwash end of the bottle, I'd guessed that Yoshiko was a rebellious teen whose parents couldn't afford the cost of an American university, so she decided that marrying an eligible bachelor would be the easiest way to get a free education. The final choice was between me and an Iowa grad student named Stanley. On the day she'd been suspended from school for maiming the kendo teacher, she was in detention passing the time reading an alternative Japanese magazine called Flem when she came across one of my poems. Your problem is, how can, the Jehovah's Witness, the Scientologist, the Political Scientist, the Social Scientist, the Mad Scientist, the Editorial Page, the 11 o'clock news, the talk radio host, the urban planner, the school superintendent, the special assistant to the president, the psychologist, the televangelist, the homeless crazy, the pontiff, the sales clerk, the bus driver, the late night cable access fuck, claim to know my problem when they don't even know my name. Stanley was quickly forgotten. Under the half moon gangster leaning over the horizon, 
I fell asleep to Al Green singing on a belly full of cornbread and fruit punch. I want to settle down and stop fooling around. Let's get married, let's get married today. And Yoshiko's finger tapping on my anus. Anaru Zimi, she whispered. I dreamed I was a flying, fire breathing foam stegosaurus starring in a schlocky Japanese film called Destroy All Negroes. I stomped high rise projects into rubble, turned out concerts by whipping my armored tail across the stage, and chewed on slow black folks like licorice sticks. The world government sent a green afro Godzilla to defeat me and we agreed to a death match in the Los Angeles Coliseum. The winner would be crowned reptile of the nuclear epoch. I was beating Godzilla into the sea with a powerful stream of radioactive turtle piss when I awoke to find Yoshiko's index finger worming its way toward my prostate. Punked for life. Stay black, and die. 10. During my stay at Boston University I went to one class. My one hour of higher education consisted of Professor Oscar Edelstein's poetry workshop, Creative Writing 104. As the next generation of great American poets stood up and introduced themselves with bohemian haughtiness, I drummed my fingers, trying to remember why I was going to college in the first place. A thin white woman with a badly scarred face was talking. Ciao Bella, ciao Bella. My name is Peyote Chandler, of the Greenwich, Connecticut, Chandlers. Let's see, now. I graduated from Londonderry Academy with honors. My favorite poet is Sylvia Plath. My mother is the ambassador to Pakistan, and my father now owns a carpet factory in North Asia. The factory employs hundreds of starving children at what I believe is a respectable living wage of seven rupees a week. I believe in third world mysticism, animism, extraterrestrial life, and, what the fuck happened to your mug? I interrupted, chin in my hand and bored with her Mayflower pedigree. Peyote was eager to explain. When I was twelve, my boyfriend, Skip Pettibone Helmsford, broke up with me, so I tried to kill myself by sticking my head in the oven like Sylvia Plath did. Only I forgot to blow out the pilot light and I stuck my head into a preheated 450 degree inferno. A chubby bearded boy in khakis a size too small and a rumpled Oxford shirt moved his elephantine mass to the front of the class, licking the edges of his drum cigarette. Greetings, my name is Chadwick Osterdorf III. I graduated from Choate with high honors and I think the only true poet ever to walk the earth was Rambo. Some parliamentary here, Hears rang out from the back of the class. It was in his footsteps that I spent this past summer selling guns to downtrodden ghetto youth to defend themselves against the oppressive system. This time I lifted my head off the desk to interrupt. Come on, Rambo wasn't no gun-running revolutionary. What he really wanted to sell was slaves, black African niggers, but he was too stupid to catch any, so he sold weapons to some king who ripped him off. Some dissident. If you was really a rhombodite, you'd amputate those two cellulite-filled legs of yours so the downtrodden ghetto youth wouldn't have to worry about you kicking them in the ass. Professor Edelstein pulled the sleeves of his tweed jacket and pressed his wire-rimmed glasses into his tanned forehead, raising the nerve to confront the boisterous black kid. And who might you be, young man? My name is Gunnar Kaufman. Gunnar Kaufman? Gunnar Kaufman from Los Angeles? Yeah. Edelstein popped out of his seat. I heard you might be attending BU, but I never dreamed you'd take my class. I saw your poem If Niggers Could Fly in the latest issue of Lofusion. I've been thinking about it all week. Edelstein took a deep breath and looked up at the ceiling. If niggers could fly, where would we alight? We orbit a treeless world nest on eveless clouds, unable to stop flapping our wings for even a second, in constant migration to nowhere. If niggers could fly. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. How old were you when you wrote that? Thirteen. I was attempting to, the Rambo wannabe removed a copy of Inkstone from his knapsack. Here's a haiku you wrote. The full May moon, Christopher Walken's forehead. 
finally has competition. Sylvia Plath picked at her scars and said, I have pictures of your poems. What you mean, you have pictures of my poems? She produced a coffee table book of photographs entitled Getotopia, an anthropologifal rending of the ghetto through the street poems of an unknown street poet named Gunnar Kaufman. What they mean by an unknown street poet named Gunnar Kaufman? More to the point, what the hell is a street poet? Gunnar, the urban piquancy of your work is so resonant, so resplendent, so resounding, you make the destitution of your environs leap off the page. You're my inspiration. What about Sylvia Plath? Well, it's really you. I thought that if I mentioned a black poet, I wouldn't be taken seriously by the rest of the class. A white woman dressed in a tie-dyed sundress, her hair knotted in blonde cornrow braids, slid her fleshy rear end onto my desk and announced herself, kicking her thick ankles high in the air. Hi, my name is Negritude. You're shitting me. My parents named me that so I would be a reminder of the hagiocratic innocence possessed by black peoples around the world. Visceral sainthood, I see. And the braids? I feel more powerful with my hair like this, really Nubian. You must know what I mean. Your scalp pulled so tight you can hear the howls of the jackals, the bellows of the hippopotami. Oh, I could properly welcome home an Ashanti warrior returned from the hunt with a fresh kill. Would you like to hear me ululate? Not really. Alilililililililai. I panicked and dashed out of the room, with my classmates and Professor Edelstein close behind. I can't believe it, Gunnar Kaufman, the underground neologist, the poet's poet, right here in my poetry workshop. Only in America. I felt like I'd been outed and exposed by my worst enemies, white kids who were embarrassingly like myself but with whom somehow I had nothing in common. To prove it I walked through the center of campus and slowly began to undress. Near the School of Engineering I released my sweater to the Boston winds. It sailed like a magic carpet past the trolleys and over the heads and outstretched hands of Professor Edelstein and the students of Creative Writing 104. My shirt, shorts, and underwear followed, sucked into a mini-tornado near the College of Liberal Arts. The clothes spiraled at a dizzying speed with dead leaves and crushed milk cartons. Soon the twister died and they fell to the ground, only to be pounced on like piñata candy by the class. I continued down Commonwealth Avenue, naked save for sneakers and socks. My black lower middle class penis fluttered stiffly in the wind like a weather vane, first to the left, then suddenly to the right. When I reached the vestibule of my apartment building, the campus police closed in on me. I heard Professor Edelstein shout, it's okay, he's a poet. Matter of fact, the best black, the best poet writing today. The cops instantly backed off. I was protected by poetic immunity. I had permission to act crazy. I pulled off an officer's hat and mussed his hair, then skipped up the stairs to my apartment and plopped face down on the couch, my head on Yoshiko's lap. She rested her textbook on my cheek and with her left hand cleaved the crack of my ass like a hacksaw. You all right, baby? Fine. What you reading? Macroeconomics. You don't mind me here? Nope, just don't move too much. How was your first class? There was a timid knock at the door. Judge for yourself. Edelstein entered, followed by Rambo, Plath, Ginsberg, Elliot, and the rest of the poetry canon, bashfully trying to avert their eyes by gazing at Coach Shimamoto's watercolor prints on the walls. Yoshiko, this is my creative writing class. Class, this is my wife, Yoshiko. Shy hellos, then whispers all around. He's married? Oh, fucking cool. I'm in Gunnar Kaufman's pad and he's naked, intense. Gunnar, a few of your classmates want to know if they can keep your clothes as mementos. You know, they might be worth something one day. I don't think one sleeve of a torn t-shirt is going to be worth much. 
What we really came by to say was that we feel you have to publish a collection of your work. Why don't you compile a manuscript, and I'll take care of the publishing end. I know some bigwig yallies in New York, and you should have a decent advance in a week and a book by spring. The people, your people, need to see your work. Yoshiko tapped her macroeconomics book on my head, which I interpreted to mean, say yes. Okay, I'll give you some things. What about a title? How about, um, Watermelonin? Gunnar, you know, this is going to change your life. The door burst open, then quickly slammed shut. Damn, nigger, every time I come over, Yoshiko got her hand halfway up your ass. But you know what they say, once you go Asian, there's no other persuasion. It was Scobie, not bothering to knock, standing in the middle of the living room oblivious to the other uninvited guests and talking loudly to make himself heard over his stereo headphones. What this shit about your life going to change? He's going to publish a book of poems. I can speak for myself, Yoshiko. She's right, I'm going to publish a book of poems. Yoshiko subtly plucked a hair from my anus. Ow. Professor Edelstein motioned for his class to open their notebooks and take notes. My visitors cleared some space, and Scobie sat on the floor Indian style, playing an imaginary vibraphone. I guessed he was still listening to Lionel Hampton. Publishing a book of poems don't change your life as much as it changes everyone else's life. Sad as your shit is, fool's going to be jumping off roofs and shit. I heard if you commit suicide your freshman year, your roommate automatically gets a perfect grade point average. That true? You thinking of committing suicide? I don't know, maybe. Depends on what your poems say. What you doing tonight? I don't know. Ain't shit to do in this town. What do you mean, Boston's a great party town, Negritude broke in, looking up from her notes and batting her eyelashes in my direction. Yoshiko threw her macro book at the interloper, hitting her squarely in the jaw. Get your slothful, fey, hippie behinds out of our apartment, now. The class hustled out of the room, a stream of Japanese curse words escorting them to the door. Gunnar, don't make me have to hurt one of these stupid white bitches. Slothful, Fay. Honey, your English is getting really good. What are we going to do tonight? There wasn't a whole lot of nigger nightlife in Boston, much less any fun spots for Japanese nationals. When we first arrived, we cruised the local bars, garish night spots crammed with white people sloshing beer on one another and singing corny white pop hits from the 1980s. Yoshiko must have punched a hundred guys who tried to pick her up with the line from the Vapor's big hit, I think I'm turning Japanese, I really think so. Looking for a more austere environment, we tried the gay spots in the South End. Our favorite hangout was Club Tribadism, a gay-slash-lesbian bar with the best jazz jukebox in the city. The patrons tolerated us until one night Nicholas and another patron got into a fight over whether Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit could be deciphered as a peon to a mentally ill queer. After a little sword fighting with pool cues, we were driven into the street and banished from club tribadism forever. Scobie got in the last word when he proclaimed that Mel Torme was the ugliest dyke he'd ever seen. By October we had finally figured out that the colored folks lived in Roxbury. Roxbury was an old, hilly community practically inaccessible by public transportation. For the most part it was a desolate place, with little to offer except decent basketball competition and a few juke joints. Our regular spot was Oscar's Onyx, a musty blues bar at the top of the hill on Mission Avenue. Friday night's brothers in platform shoes would get into knife fights, slashing the air with their eyes closed like orchestra conductors. Scobie's barbs always roused the crowd, you stupid hick, ass bean-eating stiletto-carrying coolie high niggers is still wearing leather jackets and talking about, stand back, sucker, fo, I cut cha. Niggers probably think the Black Panthers is still active. Later on male and female strippers with names like Chocolate and Brutus walked from table to table, 
soliciting dollar bills in exchange for a feel. Yoshiko and Scobie had a thing for a pot-bellied shemale stripper named Smattering of Applause. Smattering of Applause rolled his hips and fondled his tits, and when she bent over to claim her hard-earned tips, Harry butt to the audience, Yoshiko and Scobie would pelt her rear end with balled-up dollar bills. I liked the place because the bartenders wrapped napkins around the beer bottles before they handed them to you and could never adequately explain why. Habit, they said. The problem was that every night wasn't Friday night. On weekdays, while Scobie and Yoshiko did their homework, I had nothing to do. Scobie suggested I join a club. I called Dexter Waverly, president of the citywide Black Student Union, and asked and the next Ambrosia meeting was. The Black Student Union was originally called Umoja, but the name was changed because of the whites' inability to pronounce the Swahili word for unity. Dexter cleared his throat. Motep, son of Africa. The next meeting is Monday night at 8 in the School of Management basement. Come early and we'll fit you for a dashiki. You can play a talking drum, can't you? I purposely arrived late at the gathering. Harvard, BU, MIT Negroes were wearing loud African garb over their Oxford shirts and red suspenders, drinking ginger beer, and using their advertising skills to plan how best to package the white man's burden. No alcohol, brother, someone shouted. I chugged my real beer, burped, and took a seat in the back, picking up a discarded agenda from the floor. At the top of the sheet was the Ambrosia motto, the happy slave has a right to be a slave, but is still a slave nonetheless. I could hear my mother on the phone, join, Gunner, sounds like an intelligent bunch of young people. The Ambrosia members out shouting one another about how brave they'd be fighting on the front lines of America's race war reminded me of a small-town volunteer fire department shining an already shiny engine and bragging about how brave they'd be if they ever fought a real fire. But are you ready to die and kill for your people, said Chief Firefighter Dexter Waverly. Dexter wore a red dashiki trimmed with miniature elephant tusks and tightly gripped the sides of the lectern with both hands. Rally Master, they called him, able to form a coalition at a moment's notice, knows the copy center with the cheapest rates, media-friendly, dynamic speaker. Bored with the racial braggadocio, Dexter raised a hand for quiet, and the muttering stopped. I wanted to dislike Dexter, it was obvious he was a charlatan, but I was awestruck at how such an ugly motherfucker, with an eczema condition so severe that when he furrowed his brow tiny flakes of skin fell to the lectern, could hold an audience spellbound with a single gesture. I could hear his eyeballs crinkle as he looked up from the one-item agenda and scanned his audience. He seemed so angst-ridden I wanted to throw him a dog biscuit. Brothers and sisters, uh-oh, Comrade S.E. Brooks's combination fashion show and literacy program is a wonderful idea. A stroke of genius, of black feminine genius, of rump rolling, look at that, butter, greasy, you know how we do, big black titty genius. Praise due to sister Essie Brooks and all sisters like her. The men barked and stamped their feet. The women swooned and said loud amens, raising their hands in the air like castaways trying to flag down an ocean liner. I sat transfixed, trying to figure out how Dexter, a man whom I was seeing for the first time not in the cuddly company of a white woman, was the Emperor Jones of the Ivy League. Usually dating exclusively white was, for a black person, the equivalent of multiplying a lifetime of accomplishments by zero. It didn't matter what your previous accomplishments were, abolitionist, Motown diva, Olympic figure, skater, inventor of the sky hook, you had zilch stature amongst the folks. Dexter managed to be the school mandingo and maintain his race loyalty. Sometimes I'd catch him in the back alleys with the white woman of the moment. He'd greet me with a hearty, hey, black, and place a reverent fist over his heart. If I looked quizzically at his date, he'd flash the, I know it's hard to tell, smile and say, no cause for alarm, brother. Sister Cindy Zwiddeldorf is of Brazilian descent. Third World Solidarity, my brother. To validate his claim further, 
Dexter would wave a small parade flag representing the woman's supposed place of origin in tiny circles. Viva Uruguay! Trace hurrahs por Argentina! Oi como va Bolivia! I admit I admired his chutzpah and ingenuity. When Yoshiko and I walked the campus, I sometimes wilted under the evil stairs, cowering behind Yoshiko's back and covering my face in a fit of fake sneezes or forced yawns. Why you always sneeze when black people are around? I'm allergic, baby. Go, head, Dexter, a woman in front shouted. Dexter nodded in appreciation and continued. The fashion show literacy program will use the Afro chic to uplift the Afro weak. What we propose is not a marriage, marriage, if you're lucky, only lasts a lifetime. What we propose is an intellectual inheritance, an eternal trust fund for minds yet unborn. Young, black, not yet tainted by the toxic dyes of self-hatred minds. We talking tabula vive la raza. Nowadays, when you talk to the teachers of our youth, they say, the young bastards and bastardettes can't learn. They have short attention spans. Well, then you need to lengthen the attention span. If the river widens, you extend the bridge. When man invented the jet, did they say, no, man, you cannot fly these supersonic jets, the runway is too short, you can't take off, and if you manage to get the plane off the ground, you can't land? No, they lengthened the runway. And we gonna lengthen the fashion runway for our little black jets. Stretch their attention spans with fine black folks modeling black clothes. Each model male and female, I say female, cause it costs to be a black woman, each model will carry a sign with a grammar lesson on it. I can see the enthusiasm on the children's faces now. Imagine with me, if you will, the fine and sexy pre-med major light-skinned Linda Rucker, in a little one-piece bathing suit carrying a sign that reads, I before E except after F there'll be booty and learning for days. You think when the boys go to the bathroom and start beating off they going to be saying, God damn, that bitch was fine? No. They gone be pulling on their growing black manhood saying, I before E except after F. Now you know we not going to cheat our young African women out of their thrill. We'll have the bronze god and star running back Thor Haverlock in bikini briefs thunder down the runway with a sign reading, a sentence is a complete thought balanced on his bulge. When the girls get those hot flashes that accompany puberty, you better believe they're gonna be fantasizing in complete sentences. Jesus Christ, that boy is fine as hell. Anybody have any other ideas for grammatical phrases we can use? Gunnar Kaufman, esteemed poet, first-time Ambrosia attendee, what about you, my brother? How about, in general, singular subjects connected by or, nor, either slash or, or neither slash nor take a singular verb if both subjects are singular, a plural verb if subjects are plural? I left to a scattering of sado vo fe insults, nigger crazy, he trying to confuse the youth, smart alecky fool and need to be playing basketball, that's what he need to be doing. When I reached the door, Jamal Vickers handed me a manila-colored flyer and sneered, why don't you join Concoction? You think you better than everyone else. Concoction was an organization of mixed-race kids who felt ostracized by both white and colored students. Concoction, the Human Student Union the primordial soup's on. Tired of being stewed because of your biracial heritage? The jambalaya of ethnic duplicity too complicated for your black friends? The reality of the American melting pot too hot for your white amigos? Come and be a part of Concoction's goulash and celebrate your ethnic hybridization. Future Topi FS of Disfussian how to check African American slash Latino slash Asian on your job application and rise above your employer's stereotypes by asserting your biraciality in the workplace in a non-ethnic manner. Why jazz musicians tend to date white women. How to prove you are not a nigger. How to explain that you're basically white despite having Lopez as a surname. Jane Paleface, renowned Indian rights activist, 
explains how to claim 1 64th Native American heritage and get your oil and casino kickback checks without having to live on the reservation. Plebiscite on admitting full-blooded Puerto Ricans into the concoction ranks. Jamal stood there, hands on hips, waiting for a response. I wanted to explain that I'd already tried to join concoction under the guise that I was a Rwandan exchange student of Hutu and Tutsi descent but was refused admission on the grounds that its bylaws didn't consider African exogamy dual ethnicity. I decided it was pointless to talk to someone who believed a fashion show would save the black race. Folding the flyer into an origami turtle, I handed it to Jamal as a symbol of the progress of his struggle. My next foray into student activism was with SWAPO, spoiled witties against political obsequiousness. SWAPO's main concern was the school administration's support of the National Party's forces in the South African Civil War. The best thing about the SWAPO meetings was that I was allowed to drink beer while they wrote the latest act of an ongoing guerrilla theater production, an interminable piece called Bla FK Confusness is a Sovereign State of Mind. Okay. Here's the part where we hammer home the point of the play, that white liberalism is the bane of black South Africa. Gooner, will you be the ghost of Steve Biko? Fuck, no. How about the pacifist mediocre tennis player who deserts the Revolutionary Army, marries a white debutante from Nashville, writes a bestseller on how he found true love in the arms of a white woman and true freedom in the American South? You must be high. But you're our only black member. I wonder why that is. Why aren't there more black people at these SWAPO meetings? We've reached out to all the black organizations, the frats and sororities, the track team. We play classic soul music at the parties. Don't they care? Remove your hand from my shoulder and I'll tell you. See, it's like this, no one could possibly care enough to be treated like a baby seal. Colored people aren't mascots for your political attitudes. Then why do you come to the meetings? Because y'all got the best weed on campus. What can I, as a progressive white male, do? If it's at all possible, shed the fucking John Brown vibe. I don't need no crackers kissing me on the forehead like I'm a swaddling infant and leading me out of slavery. Did you know that the first person killed in the raid on Harper's Ferry was the town baggage master, a free black man? No. There are no John Browns. Thank goodness. The white boy burst into tears, soaking his shirt sleeves. Come on, guy, why are you crying? My name is John Brown. My last SWAPO event was a teach-in on civil disobedience in preparation for Boston University's gala welcoming of the South African politician Mmofo Gadabalizi, the Zulu puppet of the National Party rebels. A graying man in a Grateful Dead t-shirt was singing Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young's Find the Cost of Freedom and taking extended bong hits between choruses. I looked around for a young Rosa Parks, a gold-toothed Ralph Abernathy, but as usual I was the only black there. A grungy imitation Abby Hoffman offered me a Che Guevara LSD tab, power to the people, my brother. When the radical hippie stopped staring at all the brawless coeds, he taught us how to form human chains by linking our arms and ankles, how to double our body weight by exhaling and letting our bodies go limp as the fascist pigs carted us off the paddy wagon and how our parents could use the bail money as a small tax shelter. As the session wound down, someone asked about the specter of police brutality. The glassy-eyed facilitator ground his joint into an ashtray and for the first time looked me in the eye. When things get rough, I've found that the police treat us longhairs much more violently than they do our black and Hispanic hermanos y hermanas. I passed my hand over my lumpy scalp and heard my father tapping his billy club on the cement. So, Ms. Compadres, when things get bleak, remember to sing and sing loud. A stale version of, We Shall Overcome, chased my shivering body through the snowy streets of Boston, catching me near a statue of Abraham Lincoln lightly touching the head of a kneeling slave. The slave's pleading expression seemed to say, Free me, boss. You ain't got to free nobody else, just me. 
I leaned into the slave's brass ear and whispered, Tag, you're it. The next night Yoshiko and I woke up with soggy pillows and tear-stained cheeks. What was your dream about? What was your dream about? I asked you first. I dreamed me, Nat Turner, Gabriel Prosser, Sink, and Dee Dee Lancaster were fighting alongside the Irish Republican Army, driving through the streets of Belfast in a station wagon, shooting at the British troops, and singing Find the Cost of Freedom. FND the COSTO of FRE Dom buried in the GR round. After a while we got tired of the British machine gunning us, so we tied a baby to the back of the station wagon. We'd buzz the Brits and they'd turn to shoot but wouldn't fire when they saw a wailing kid lashed to the rear door. But one day they said fuck it and shot back, killed Nat, Gabriel, Dee Dee, and the baby. I ended up teaching at a hearse driving school. Who's Dee Dee Lancaster? This girl I knew in the eighth grade. One day in front of the whole class, Ms. Hanger, the social studies teacher, said she was stupid and would never amount to anything. Dee Dee beat Ms. Hanger to a pulp and threw her out a window. Broke her jaw and cracked three ribs. The whole time she was kicking her ass, Dee Dee was screaming, just because you a teacher don't make you innocent. What's funny is Dee Dee's grades improved after that. Whose baby did you tie to the car? Ours. Good. What was your dream about, Yoshiko? We had a kid and we were tucking her into bed, telling her bedtime stories. What's so bad about that? The stories went like this. This story is called, The Little Fuck Who Cried Wolf. Once upon a time there was this shepherd boy who always screaming wolf like a little bitch. Oh shit, you got to stop hanging out with them onyx niggers. I put my head back on the pillow. Yoshiko, you pregnant? I think so. Good. Having failed to find a stimulating extracurricular activity, I soon found myself in familiar surroundings, the basketball gym, my sneakers squeaking, yelling, help right, and switch, and watching coach Slick Palomino shout and throw chairs at the white kids. Despite playing well and enjoying Scobie's company on the court, I became depressed with my purposeless life, sad-eyed, I'd tow the free-throw line in an arena filled with screaming maniacs, pondering the worthlessness of my existence. Two shots, gentlemen. Relax on the first. The referee would hand me the ball with a stern look, trying to talk with the whistle in his mouth. Kaufman, you look glum. What's wrong, having a poetic moment? I don't know. Been reading Schopenhauer and I can't figure out my raison d'etre. Your purpose in life is to make these free throws, then run back and play defense. Fuck that. Scobie, his chest heaving up and down, would chime in. Your purpose is to take care of your pregnant wife and raise your kid. That ain't no purpose, that's a responsibility. If I had the money, I could pay someone to do that. Kaufman, shoot the ball. Yasu, Masa. Swish. Swish. My only comforts were the boxes of Japanese literature Yoshiko would send me on the road trips. Returning to the hotel exhausted from another game, I'd find carefully wrapped copies of the love suicide plays of Chikamatsu, the biographies of Yukio Mishima and Sakai Saburo, the diaries of Heian ladies in waiting on the bed. My favorites were the autobiographical tales of Osamu Dazai, the heavy-hearted writer who wandered the back roads of Japan struggling to raise the nerve to commit suicide in the Tamagawa River. In return I would send Yoshiko rocks, seashells, and fossils from riverbeds and oceans across America. Sparkling checkered periwinkles and smooth pismo clams from Titipools in Monterey, California. Hideous skeletons of trilobites and dalmanites embedded in sandstone from the Black Hills in the Dakotas. Purple fluorite cubes, emerald green malachite, sharp clear spears of gypsum from the Utah Flats, toast black slabs of slate from Vermont, tenderly wrapped in love letters. Dear Yoshiko, I'm writing this letter during halftime of the Cornell game. Coach Palomino is foaming at the mouth, kicking lockers and shit screaming like Fay Ray. 
This is a must-win game. I know you boys, excuse me, Gunnar, my apologies, I know you men are trying to be winners. Every game is a must-win game. The Shinos and the other FOFO gene, not including Nicholas, of course, are looking shameful and nodding at every word coach says, like they've done something wrong. Most of these stupid clowns don't even play. I can't understand why they give a fuck. Oh shit, coach just slapped Isaac Gottlieb for missing a lay up during the pre-game warm-up. Yoshiko, I miss you so much it hurts. Sabishi Kunario. I really don't have anyone to talk to. Scobie is losing his mind. Hold on a moment, Coach Palomino is going into the teamwork speech, I don't want to miss this. Two days ago against Dartmouth he pulled down his pants and stroked his penis. Now I'm going to shoot my wad. Then we'll be on equal terms. Tonight's exhortation looks more conventional, it's the hackneyed, there is no, I, in team, speech. There's no, you either, but I guess that's immaterial when you're getting paid thousands of dollars to teach young athletes how to navigate the perils of life and hundreds of thousands of dollars to ensure that these same athletes wear a certain brand of sneaker. I still won't wear the shoes. Slick offered me a thousand dollars a game, but I told him to get fucked. He realizes that if he wins, it doesn't matter what shoes I wear. Did I tell you I refuse to stand for the national anthem? Pissed off everybody. I guess coach has been telling the media I'm a Jehovah's Witness, because during a post-game interview a reporter asked me did I think the United States was in cahoots with Satan. I went into some diatribe on how America is Satan. Some shit about how the United States of America anagrammed was, foes in death tear. I come taste. The media pretty much leaves me alone now. All this talk about teamwork and self-sacrifice is making me think about the books you sent me. Mishima said that to reach a level of consciousness that permits one to peek at the divine, one must sacrifice individual idealism. I'm like, nigger, please. What in hell is the divine? Some bright light with a walking cane and a beard? A state of being so enlightened that you know everything worth knowing? I can pay a drug dealer ten bucks and achieve that level of consciousness, at least for an hour or so. Mishima goes on to say that, only bodies placed under the same circumstance can experience a common suffering. Through the suffering of the group the body can reach the height of existence that the individual alone can never attain. I agree, but this, height of existence, trip doesn't have much value on the open market. I think that 6 million gas Jews, 15 million dead Africans, their lungs filled with salt water, 436 Champavat Indians eaten by a single tiger in 1907, might agree with me. And what is, the group? You can't put numbered uniforms on people and say this is, the group, or say everyone born on this side of the fence is, the group. And not everyone experiences pain and suffering in the same way. I can see some masochistic slave fucking up on purpose just for a few precious licks of rawhide. Speaking of suffering, I think Scobie is going insane. The scrutiny he is undergoing is unbelievable, ten times worse than in high school. What seems like every sports writer in America, the entire Boston University philosophy, African American studies, religion, biology, mathematics, and physics departments, and a horde of German and Japanese scientists are following him 24 hours a day. Keeping track of his meals, sleeping habits, shit like that. Once a day some Nobel Prize winning professor has a press conference to announce a new asinine theory on Nicholas's uncanny ability to put a ball in a basket. The philosophers are easily the most despicable of the lot. I suppose they have the most to lose. Every other scientist can say, well, it is at least possible, they haven't really accepted that he is never, ever going to miss, but Socrates never said nothing about a motherfucker like Scobie. Nick's thrown every theory, every formula, every philosophical dogma out of whack, he's like a living disclaimer. I am perfection, everything else is bullshit. Your life is meaningless. 
So the philosophers show up at the games, full of anticipatory schadenfreude, armed with computer printouts calculating the odds of Scobie's missing his next shot. Praying that Nick's next attempt will roll in and out of the rim and the universe will return to normal. Invariably, Scobie goes six for six and leaves them in tears, ripping their papers to shreds and cursing epistemology. They would be a lot better off if they simply called Scobie a god and left it at that, but no way they'll proclaim a skinny black man god. The scariest part is the team introduction. Silence for everybody except me and Scobie. I'm the preliminary buoy, I run out to a smattering of booze, dodge a few paper cups, and try to ignore the catcalls. Communist son of a bitch. Love it or leave it, you black bastard. Scobie's introduction is communal catharsis. Within moments the court is covered with bananas, coconuts, nooses, headless dolls, and shit. I'm into it, but Scobie gets shook. The few black fans in the house, mostly boosters from the Onyx and the black kids from whatever campus we're at, stand and applaud, but they're quickly shouted down by whites. After Scobie hits his first basket, fights break out, it's sick, there's so much scorn in the world. Usually when you dive into the crowd for a loose ball, the fans try to catch you, help break your fall. When Nick goes headlong in the stands, the reporters scatter, picking up their coffee cups and laptops and letting Scobie crash into the table. They don't even help the nigger to his feet. Assholes. Funny thing happened the other day in Michigan, though. Nicholas was running full tilt toward the basket and did a swan dive into the crowd for absolutely no reason. His form was perfect, chest out, arms spread, feet together, toes pointed. The fans flew out of harm's way like parking lot pigeons. In the center of the vacated section stood a small black girl forming a basket with her spindly arms, poised to catch the airborne Scobie. Wouldn't you know it, Scobie landed right on top of her, but she caught his ass. His feet didn't touch down till she lowered him to the ground. The crowd booed her, but it was the first time I'd seen Nick smile in two weeks. It's not all bad though, sometimes the crowd is on our side. Our meaning down with me and Scobie. When we played Columbia, I swear, all of Harlem was in the gym. They were quiet except when one of us scored, they could give less than a care who won. Remember at the Harvard game, black folk from as far away as Peabody and Situate were in the house. I bet the Harvard kids didn't even know so many niggers existed. It was good to see you in the stands, and hearing you scream, take the motherfucker to the hole, gooner. I could feel your eyes on me wherever I went. Did I tell you how mad coach got when you came to sit next to me on the bench? He thinks it sets a bad example for his best player to hold hands with his wife during the game. Now I pretend you're always there right next to me, Florida, Colorado, wherever. Sometimes if I need to talk to you I'll commit a stupid foul on purpose so Slick will take me out of the game and I'll get a chance to talk to you on the bench. Do you hear me? Ikaga diso ka? My asa nani o shimasu? Asahan and I Sakana o Tabamesu ka? Seneke o Sajurishoka? Sometimes I'll be dribbling up court and I'll hear your voice, take that motherfucker to the hole, gooner. Coach is still rambling on, Scobie is sitting on a stool listening to Sarah Vaughn. That's all he listens to now. I hear you, last time you saw him he was all Bud fucking Powell this, Bud Powell that, what happened to Q through you? I asked him the same thing and he goes, I ain't missed shit, Quinichette, Rollins, Sanders, Shep, Silver, Simone, Taylor, and any fools whose names start with you, niggers is too sappy. I ain't got time for that free love, we're all human beings saccharine jazz. So I ask what's so special about Sarah. Sarah's not one those tragic niggers white folks like so much. Sarah a niggers nigger, she be black coffee. Not no mocha peppermint kissy kissy butter rum do you have any, heroin cafe latte. The boy's crazy. She be black coffee, what the fuck does that mean? 
Scobies into the stuff you sent me, at the hotel or on the plane will be listening to Sarah and Nicholas will make me read him a Chikamatsu play. Whenever the sake dealer and the loyal courtesan cross the bridge and start looking among the cherry blossoms for a place to kill themselves, Nicholas weeps with the star-crossed lovers. I know what it feels like to live in a world where you can't live your dreams. I'd rather die too. Why won't they leave us alone? They fuck up your dream. They fuck up your dream. The melodrama goes well with Sarah's sultry ass voice, though. I'm beginning to see the sheer casual genius of Chikamatsu writing for the puppet theater. If I blur my eyes, I can see the black strings attached to my joints and stretching to the skies. Ah, the freedom of fatalism. Now I can do what the fuck I want and blame it on the puppet master. Watakushi Wanoto G.A. Kawakamashita. Bairu O.N.I. Han Marimasho. Nicholas sees the strings, but he spends all his time looking for a pair of scissors. Every now and then the puppet master hands him a pair of wooden scissors, Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, Sarah Vaughan, an open jump shot, and Scobie thinks he's free, thinks he's clipped his strings. The slack string is just a slack string. I hear the band starting up, I have to go now. Yoshiko, can you do me a favor? Please make an appointment for Scobie to see someone at the counseling office. I ask the coach to do it, but he thinks if Scobie is averaging 19 points a game he's fine. We get back next Monday. Thanks. I love you. Here is another handprint in ballpoint pen ink. Please, rub it over your stomach and give the fetus my love. The second best part of the ink print is that eventually the ink gets all over the basketball and all over everyone else's hands and uniforms. Shit's hilarious. Maybe you should make an appointment for me too. I shitteru. See you soon. Your husband, Gunnar.